Okay, well, I think, um, um, Radio, we're good to get started. We have a larger group of people, of participants, and I'm sure more will be joining us um, as we um, uh, move forward with the, with the webinar. Um, so I know uh, several of you have already been uh, hearing us uh, speak, but, you know, just to, uh, um, you know, do the formalities. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. Um, I am Carolina Caeiro. I am coordinator of uh, development projects at LACNIC. Um, and today I will be moderating this webinar on uh, promoting gender diversity in the technical community and more specifically on how corporate culture can contribute to generating more diverse and inclusive work environments. Um, I would like to start off with a few quick announcements about the dynamics and, and logistics uh, for today's webinar. Um, the first thing that I would like to mention for everyone's information is that the webinar will be recorded. Um, so please keep that in mind. We hope that's uh, not an issue for any of the participants today. Um, as you know, our main speaker for this webinar will be uh, Pierre Perlman, um, who I'll introduce uh, in a second. Um, we will have a 15 to 20 minute presentation by her on the question of corporate culture. Um, and then we will open up for some additional 15 minutes of um, Q&A, questions and answers. Um, there are essentially two ways of asking questions. You may type your question at any time in the chat and we will read it uh, for you once we open up for Q&A. Or you may also raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon at the bottom of the screen and we will open up your mic uh, so that you can ask your questions directly to Radia also during the Q&A segment. Um, lastly, I wanted to let you know that today's webinar will be fully in English. Um, we do know, however, that there, um, there are actually many uh, Spanish and Portuguese uh, speakers in the audience. So please feel free to ask your questions in the language of your preference and we will translate them for, for Radia. Um, this webinar is part of the IT Women webinar series. Um, IT Women is an initiative by LACNIC uh, that seeks to promote greater diversity and female participation in the technical community in the Latin American and Caribbean region. So if you're not yet part of this group uh, and you would like to sign up, I will be circulating the link uh, to do so uh, in the chat uh, in just one second. Um, before jumping into, uh, into Radia's um, presentation today, we will have some opening remarks by Laura Kaplan, Development and Cooperation Manager at LACNIC. Um, Laura will provide a bit of background as to why we propose to focus on the question of corporate culture for our last um, IT Women webinar of 2019 um, and explain a little bit, you know, how this all fits in within sort of uh, LACNIC's uh, lar larger uh, gender strategy. Uh, Laura, if you don't mind, we can start um, with you. Uh, we can go straight into your remarks now. Yes, of course. Thank you, Carolina. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Radia and also thank her because it's really a privilege uh, to have her addressing this issue that uh, really, um, I think, is, is, is a thing that um, worries a lot of, of us and also we are uh, trying to solve uh, through the um, Women in IT uh, program. Um, as you may all uh, know, uh, the rates of participation of women in, in our different uh, events and, and participation spaces are very low. Uh, from that uh, numbers and from that information, we start uh, trying to investigate or trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, we, in, in our last webinar, uh, Carolina Guerre, uh, our colleague, um, um, explain and well uh, make a presentation about the, the issues that we address uh, in that investigation and one of our main points uh, our main barrier that we find out uh, was that um, the the labor market the, the companies are our um, main, uh, not only barrier, but are the, the space in which we have uh, more problems. Why is that? Well, because um, even that we don't, maybe uh, we don't have as many as technical women uh, as men, um, we find out that these women 
can't get uh, senior positions. That is very hard to compete with men, even if they are as qualified as them. Uh, we also find out that maybe uh, they, have, they are in a team um, and their boss uh, choose uh, another colleague to send to important meetings. And we find out that that's very a, a cultural thing. That's a culture and that's a social and, and in many or most um, occasions, it, it, it has nothing to do with the technical capacities. Um, and the, the thing is, uh, from Langnick, uh, we are working in, in, in this field, but we cannot um, get involved in what is going on, what is going on inside that companies because it's, it's not our our field. Um, but we think that is really uh, it's an issue and it's really important to talk about this. So um, this presentation that Radia, Radia, sorry, Radia is going to, to share with us, uh, I think is going to be very interesting. And I think that uh, it's important to us to start um, thinking and start uh, taking notes about uh, how uh, can we change some, some of these um, concepts or, or some of these uh, ways of, of dealing with the uh, diversity inside the companies. Um, so, Radia, if you are ready, we are very... Hello? Hello, I'm here. Ah, sorry. Uh, if, you, if you are ready, uh, we are very excited to hear from you. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, this is not really an organized presentation. It's, it's mostly to raise some issues and then get the audience involved in um, asking questions. You should feel free to ask me anything. Um, so yeah, the, the issue of gender diversity is sort of interesting. Um, it's, there's remarkably few women. The more senior you get, the fewer there are. And I've been in this industry for, you know, like almost a hundred years now, it feels like, and it hasn't actually changed, which is kind of interesting. So, um, why do we care? Um, you know, it really shouldn't matter whether you have people with different skin colors and body shapes, but what really matters is to have a group that can leverage each other's strengths and see things from different points of view. So um, I'm not the traditional engineer. Um, I never like took anything apart when I was little. I um, was, you know, good at logic problems. I was good at school, but it never occurred to me to take anything apart. Um, and so there's this stereotype of an engineer. I've heard that there was this um, hiring manager at one of the high tech companies that would ask um, candidates, what was your hobby when you were 12? And if you didn't say, I got a bunch of spare parts from Radio Shack and I made my own computer, they just wouldn't take you seriously. Um, so I have, the fact that I'm a little bit different than the other people, um, um, than a lot of the other people means I found a very important ecological niche. So what I tend to do um, is rather than diving right into code and seeing the world as being the details of one particular implementation, I um, get rid of all of the um, details and get to the conceptual heart of our problem. Um, and I also just cannot get taken away by hype. So when people just tell me things, I don't necessarily believe them um, unless I really can independently understand why that would be true. So these sorts of things um, make me a little bit different. So in building a team, if there's somebody who just uh, hates giving presentations, um, that's fine, you know, rather than uh, telling them that they're not good because they can't, they have this weakness, find somebody else who, who's really good at communicating. Um, something else about diversity that makes me really nervous is the very visible women events. Um, reinforce the stereotype that women need special help and that they um, um, are probably not as qualified. Uh, because the perception is that if you're female and you walk up to any high-tech company, you say, hire me. 
and they say, why should we hire you? And you say, oh, I'm, a, I'm female. And they go, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I didn't notice, come right in. It, it doesn't actually work that way. Um, there's more of the unconscious bias because um, hiring is a very subjective thing. So um, do you remind the um, hiring manager of a younger version of themselves? Um, so, you know, it, it's, I just get sort of nervous. Um, I have a friend who's a, a doctor who's black and he works for an HMO. So um, um, patients get assigned to him. And he said when he first sees a new patient, he sort of feels like they have this sense of panic about, is this a real doctor or is it someone who just got into, grad school, uh, into med school because they were black? And I don't know how much of that is just kind of his imagining, but there's probably some amount of that. So um, the more kind of visible things that are unfortunately reinforce that, that kind of stereotype um, and you know, breeds resentment and stuff like that. So the question is how can we help things without causing kind of this backlash that um, you know, wh when somebody is um, has been hired or promoted, people assume, well, yeah, they, they must have just been desperate for women, so that's why they got hired. Um, um, yeah, when I was, um, um, many years ago, they um, invented this thing called Take Your Daughter to Work Day. And um, so I was at Digital Equipment Corporation at the time, and they um, had Make Your Own Sundays, Tours of the Lab, so of course I was going to bring my 10 year old daughter uh, because it seemed like a lot of fun, but what was I going to tell my sweet seven year old son? You know, you can't go because you're a male chauvinist pig. <laughs> you know? um, it, it, I'm sure that that event did not actually make any difference in the career of any, any of the girls. So I'm so pleased that they changed it to take your ch uh, children to work day rather than take your daughter to work day. Uh, let's see, what else was I going to say about diversity? I, I, don't, um, I don't remember for the moment. Okay, so yeah, let me tell you about my career path. So um, I was you know, always good at school, um, I, especially at science and math things. I wasn't actually happy about it um, you know, like when, um, I mean, I wanted straight A's, but, um, you know, when I knew the next year we'd be taking chemistry, it was like, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to be the best student. Um, but, um, my fantasy was that some boy would do better than me at some math or science thing. And my plan was to fall in love with him and marry him. So, um, at any rate, after years of all of that, when I was um, like a junior in high school, there was a teacher that noticed there was a computer programming class at a nearby uh, college, and she could sign a few of us up there, drive us over, wait for the class to be done, drive us back. I mean, teachers are just awesome. They don't get paid extra for this sort of thing. So I walked into this class, and all the students were talking about how they had built ham radios when they were seven. I had no idea what a ham radio was. I was quite sure that if I stumbled across one, I wouldn't know how to turn it on or use it or anything. And then they were asking questions with fancy words like input. I had no idea what that was, but my mind shut down. And for the first time, I got nothing out of that class because I assumed that I was so far behind that um, you know, I would never catch up. And this is actually a very useful lesson that um, once you lose self-confidence, once you believe you can't do something, you won't be able to do it. Now, I'm not quite sure how to convince ourselves that yes, you can do it once you've decided that you can't, but at the very least, you can help other people. So if you notice that their stumbling block is, um, you know, is self-confidence, then just reassure them. Don't, don't worry. I can help you. Uh, you can do this. Um, so let's see. And, um, oh, it's so yeah. So um, I went to college and at that point, if you had asked me what I wanted to do um, as a career, I'd say, 
well, I'd be interested in pretty much anything except for computers. I knew I hated computers at that point. Um, still do, by the way. <laughs> um, and I think the industry could um, benefit from having more people that hate computers. So you wouldn't have um, um, computers asking you things like, do you want POP or IMAP? Uh, that, that was when I was installing an email client on my machine. Um, and it asked me that. And I no human should be asked a question like that. I happen to know that they're both email standards, but why would I care? You know, it turned out to be very important. I had to choose the same standard that the uh, mail server was speaking, but how on earth was I supposed to know? So, um, yeah, I think having more engineers that have actually met some human beings would, um, you know, make our products a whole lot better. So um, anyway, in college, I did learn to program because I was taking a physics class and the TA said to me, um, I have a project and I need a programmer. Would you like to be my programmer? And I said, I don't know how to program. And he said, yes, I know. That's why I'm asking you because I have no money to pay you. And if you knew how to program, you'd expect to be paid. Uh, but you're obviously bright. I was doing well in the class and I'm sure you could learn. And the reason I agreed was um, uh, to do it was that I had a boyfriend, if you want to be, um, if I <laughs> will be totally honest, who knew how to program. And I figured that was a safe environment. So yeah, I learned to program. It's fun. Um, and then let's say um, grad school and um, I knew how to take classes, um, but my perception was that everybody else was in graduate school because they were smart. And I had just gotten into graduate school because I studied really hard. I couldn't imagine doing original research. Just some other species did that. Um, and the MIT math department was very unhelpful. You had to find your own advisor. So once I did everything but a thesis, I had to knock on doors of professors and say, um, I need an advisor. And all of them said, well, I'm a big, important, busy person which was very discouraging. So luckily I didn't spend too much time doing that before an old friend said, are you enjoying um, grad school? And I said, no, I'm completely floundering. I have no idea how to find an advisor or a thesis topic. And he said, oh, come join our group. And that was at um, um, kind of a um, consulting company called BBN um, that was doing, um, uh, packet radio, dawn of networking, um, um, and doing routing protocols, which I um, discovered I loved. Whoops, I have this thing that says your internet uh, connection is unstable. So um, maybe we should turn off the video. I was that will say, help, uh, I think. Uh, Radia, this is Carolina. Uh, we just lost you for like a brief, you know, five seconds. Um, uh, but we yeah, got you back. Me, so uh, turn off the video. Yeah, absolutely. So Go that ahead. Thank you. Less, um, less bandwidth necessary. So uh, you're hearing me okay? Yes. Yeah. We do. Okay, good. So let's see. Um, um, right. So I discovered that I just love network protocols. The concept of having all these little teeny computers that... Um, all do their own little piece of the puzzle and it all fits together like a beautiful symphony. So, um, you know, that was, um, I, I love it. I probably would have loved anything, but um, I, I certainly didn't plan to um, do network protocols. You know, it, I'd liked six, I designed my first network protocol, um, but no, I, you know, it was just totally random and I love, how my career turned out. Um, so what I tell people who are struggling with making decisions, you know, should I go to grad school or should I go in industry? Which of these two jobs should I take? I tell them that you'll never have enough information to make a truly informed decision. Um, you know, it depends so much on um, the people you're working with or, or whatever. Um, and so I tell, tell them, you really won't be able to make an informed decision. And there's basically two types of people in the world, those that would be happy with either decision 
and those that would be unhappy with either decision. So um, anyway, so then for other totally random um, um, events, I wound up exactly the right place at the right time, which was um, at Digital Equipment Corporation being in charge of designing routing protocols for them. And that's where I was sort of able to make the most impact on the industry. So um, that being said, um, so I really am, um, you know, fascinated with how computers communicate in order to make the network efficient and all that. But I also um, like to observe people, um, you know, carbon-based uh, networks. So um, I notice, like, um, in order to create a good culture, um, it has to be safe to ask questions. Now that sounds obvious, but um, one of the groups that I was in, um, at, um, the culture was dominated by these super aggressive, obnoxious people that everyone assumed were, um, they must be geniuses because they were very tall and very obnoxious or something. Um, and by the way, I have yet to meet anyone who's really actually good technically who acts that way but somehow people get taken in by that. Um, I assumed they were brilliant too until I eventually had to kind of understand the things they were designing and none of the stuff that they designed actually um, ever worked. But um, at any rate, if you were in a meeting, especially, you know, especially in public, if you were to ask a question, they would say, if you don't know that, you don't belong in this group. If you can just, imagine <laughs> what that does to somebody who's, who's um, asked a question. So um, if somebody asks me a question that everybody, I assume, would know, like what's a public key, I don't say, how can you not know that? I say, oh my goodness, it is the coolest thing ever. And I can't believe my good luck that I have the honor to be the first person to explain it to you. It's so cool, let me explain it. Um, so that's kind of the right way to ask questions, answer questions. Another way to think of it is sometimes when somebody asks you a really basic question, it makes you rethink your foundations. And sometimes the foundations are wrong and it helps you think outside the box when you have to sort of clearly explain some um, basic decision that was made a long time ago. Um, the other part of it is that once you get to be senior, you start thinking, oh, I'm supposed to know everything. And nobody does. If you actually think you know everything, you really should retire because you're very dangerous. Um, but um, if you really want to be a role model, you should show that you are perfectly comfortable admitting that you don't know everything, that you yourself know that you don't know everything, and you're perfectly comfortable about that, and you should be the first person to ask basic questions. Um, so yeah, I was um, at a meeting um, of, of our company where somebody spoke for like an hour about how wonderful Cloud Native was. And after his talk, I said to the person next to me at my table, um, I said, I still have no idea what Cloud Native means. What does it mean? And he said, I don't know. And then everybody at our table, we all said, yeah, we have no idea what it means. Um, so that's another part of it, which is that um, when you give a talk and you're using buzzwords, you, you might have lived with that buzzword for long enough that you think you know what it means, but it doesn't take any longer when you're giving a talk to actually explain these things. And often a buzzword like, um, yeah, we want our systems to be resilient. Well, what does that mean? It's a perfectly valid English word, but it can mean so many different things. Um, does it mean that um, it never crashes, or if it crashes, that it recovers quickly, um, or that you never lose data, or it, um, it's a distributed system that even if some of the participants are... Um, um, malfunctioning or actively malicious, the system still works. That, by the way, was what my thesis was about, was designing a network that works properly, even if some of the 
uh, switches are downright malicious. So let's see, um, critical thinking. Um, that sort of drives me crazy. Recently, the um, CTO introduced me as Dell's bullshit to totally like that. <laughs> I'd like to put it on my business card. But um, when things are just wildly hyped, people just kind of assume that there must be something there. Um, and it's so important to realize that not everything you read is actually true. So um, an example of something wildly hyped is blockchain. Um, and in general, people don't really even know what it means. All they know is that it's going to solve all the world's problems. And what they do is they um, look at things like, um, and they say, how can I use blockchain in this application? Because obviously adding blockchain to it makes it you know, better somehow. Or what can I build on blockchain? And I say, no, that's the wrong um, direction to come from. What you need to do is say, what problem am I solving? Look at various ways of solving it and uh, then take the best one. Um, and if it turns out to be blockchain, that's fine. But I have yet to see any application that couldn't be solved in a more efficient um, you know, sort of way. Um, and then I've run into engineers that say, but my management is, um, uh, is pressuring me. They, they want blockchain. And what I tell them is, fine, uh, still do what I said, which is what problem you're solving, what properties you need, um, look at various approaches, build the best one, and then just tell your manager, oh, yeah, I'm using blockchain. So um, anyway, so I think um, at this point, uh, it looks like there might actually be um, questions here. Should, um, are there any questions here? Um, uh, we have a comment from uh, Beth uh, in, the, um, in the audience. Beth, I can read it for you, or if you want to um, have us uh, open your mic, you can ask the question directly. Do you have a preference? Well, I just read the question. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, if, uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably faster um, for me to paraphrase it. So it's, you know, what advice would you give to women who are re-entering the workforce? So yes, that is very hard when you have a hole in your resume to, um, to get a job. And you have to be willing to take a lot of no's without assuming that, you know, without giving up. Um, so you have to act cheerful. And um, so for instance, when um, um, what you should do is do research on the company. So you walk into company A and you say, this is exactly where I want to work because they do this, that, and that. And then you walk into company B, which does completely other things. Say, yes, I, I was born to want to work at company B. Um, you know, um, look at the um, do research on the person interviewing you. If they've written a paper, say, um, wow, you know, I, I read that paper, it's really interesting. And by the way, um, have you thought of doing this extra thing? So uh, don't just kind of walk in, um, um, yeah, uh, cold and do that. Now I happened, I dropped out of graduate school. I went back 10 years later for bizarre reasons. And I was a little worried about, gee, um, people will wonder what's this old lady doing in the class. Um, well, as it turns out, you know, like um, a few days into the class, one of the poor um, students asked me on a date, and I said, "Oh, that's very flattering." Um, but actually, I'm an old lady. I'm, I have kids. I, I'm attached. But you know, uh, thank you for the thought. Um, but also, I was thinking I would have forgotten everything that I knew which was true, and especially because I decided instead of math to go into computer science to force myself to take computer science classes since I was in the computer industry, and I had just been in, in you know, a straight math before that. So um, it turns out that um, I had learned some secrets, like um, if the teacher is rambling on, which a lot of them do, 
And I could tell that nobody in the audience was understanding what they were saying. Ask questions. When I was um, in school the first time, I would have um, assumed, oh, I don't want to waste the class's time because everyone else is following it. I'm the only one who um, isn't. Um, I also used to absolutely panic before a test. I could never sleep the night before a test. I was so stressed out. Um, but then I realized when I went back as a grown up 10 years later, I realized that um, if you've been following the class and doing the homework, you're going to do fine on the test. Um, I had also taught at, um, before that, and I knew how hard it was to come up with problems. So I um, kind of looked forward to seeing what the teacher would you know, choose in terms of problems. So um, yeah, in terms of going back, um, maturity helps a lot. And um, try to act interested in both the person who's interviewing you, the, what the group is doing that's interviewing you, and what the company is. And don't take it too hard when you um, um, will get some rejections. Uh, the other thing is um, it feels wrong to use friends, uh, uh, but everybody does. So um, I know when, um, when I was in that group with the um, really obnoxious people <laughs> um, that everyone assumed were geniuses, they had a higher title than me. And so eventually I decided to go to the manager and um, say, you know, I think I deserve the same title as them. And um, it was very difficult for me to do this. I, it's just every atom of my being just was rebelling about my trying to talk about myself. But, um, you know, I said, hey, you know, I have a PhD. I wrote this book that uh, everyone's using. The technology that I developed has changed the industry. Um, so I think I deserve that title. And my manager, who was otherwise, a, he meant well, and he was one of the smartest people I've ever worked with. So I, I absolutely think, you know, he was a good person other than being kind of clueless about people. And I, I have great sympathy for people in this industry who are kind of clueless about people. But he just couldn't see me as equivalent to these other people. Um, now, as it turns out, <laughs> I wasn't equivalent. I was like much better, but um, you know, he just couldn't see me as being the same sort of person. So he said to me, well, um, you know, so you have all those things that you mentioned that you can feel proud about and they have a higher title to compensate. <laughs> you know, this was many, many years ago. Um, another thing the manager used to do when I would um, do something like really clever, like he was away for one week, and by the time he came back, I had the um, I had designed the spanning tree um, and written the spec and had the poem <laughs> all put on his desk, and he he read it and and sort of realized how how important this was and um, how simple it was. But every time I did something like that, he would um, say, wow. And then he'd look at me and say, how did you think of that? You know, it's like, it should have been one of the smart people. But um, anyway, so I'm not sure. I, yeah, I've kind of rambled about the um, advice for going back. But the hardest thing will be that you're competing with people that don't have a hole in their resume. Um, and I don't know exactly how to overcome that kind of bias that um, there will be, but hopefully you'll get at least one job. Don't look for the absolute best job you could get. Take anything. And then once you have a job, it's so much easier to get other jobs. And you know, just make the best of a job. So whatever it is, um, no matter how lowly it is, look for opportunities to do additional things and um, you know, and you can grow and move within a company. It's getting your foot in the door that's really the hardest part. Um, so okay, let's see. thank you, yeah. um, Radia. We do have another question uh, from um, Javier Guevara. 
uh, it is safe to ask questions in this um, uh, space. He's uh, um, mentioning at the uh, you know, beginning of the question that, that it's a bit off subject, but we'll ask it anyway. Um, the question is, do you think machine learning and machine reasoning will make network administrators uh, job decisions uh, go extinct? Um, we also have another question by Lito Ibarra. Hi, Radia. Uh, speaking about titles, mainly academic, do you think uh, especially women should ask to be addressed with the same, uh, pardon me, with the title before their name within the work environment? This may sound presumptuous, yeah. but uh, may be needed. What do you think? Yeah, so that's, that, I'll answer the second question first. Um, yeah, it's, um, I feel very sort of weird uh, with people calling me Dr. Pearl, and I'm sort of very low-key. Um, one of the things I like is that, um, or one of my strengths is that I'm so approachable. Once people get to know me, they realize that um, it, very easy to talk to, very sympathetic, non-judgmental, and they can run ideas by me and I can say, ah, actually that doesn't work uh, because of this interesting case and I won't make them feel stupid. So um, I'm not um, naturally inclined to be pompous that way. But one time I was on some sort of panel, um, and of course I was the only woman um, with a bunch of other people, and they asked um, how I should be, um, how it's fine. And so then I do that. I, you know, that <laughs> I have to be sort of more careful. So, um, in general, I mean, with, with colleagues, I, I don't know a, um, an environment where people call each other, you know, Mr. Whatever. Um, I was really pleased when I um, got my PhD because people would sometimes say, are you Miss or Mrs? And then I could finally say doctor. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it depends on the environment. I never like to be pompous, but there's some times where um, it is important to be. Um, you know, if you're talking to customers or something and they want to be reassured that the company is sending an important person, then um, perhaps do that. So, um, you know, with my lack of being pompous, um, nobody ever kind of took me seriously until I happened to write the book Interconnections, which became kind of the book that every networking person would have that in their office. Um, and that really changed my professional life. Um, you know, because people would be introduced to me, look at one, you know, take one glance and say, oh yeah, boring person, then hear my name. And it was like, oh, that's the name on the book. Um, but that's much harder to do these days because there's so much free information on the internet that very few people buy books anymore. So, um, uh, yeah, all I can say in answer to that question is sometimes you have to act pompous, but don't do it all the time. It's, um, um, I find it sort of offensive when people always insist on, on acting that way. Um, okay, now in terms of machine learning and machine reasoning, um, that's a big buzzword these days. And, um, I don't think it's really going to, um, well, I don't know. I mean, it's really not my um, area of expertise. Um, it does make me incredibly nervous. Um, um, so for instance, when you say, okay, I'm going to have these magic boxes in a network that will do machine learning to understand what um, correct um, um, traffic flows are. And then if things are different, the box will do something because it will have learned that things are different. And that really, really scares me because um, the box is completely harmless as long as it doesn't detect that something's going on. But then if you have like an emergency, like the building is on fire or something, um, and um, you know, then the traffic patterns change, 
you don't want this box suddenly deciding that it wants to turn off, um, you know, communication or, or do anything weird. It's the kind of thing you wouldn't have tested. Um, you know, like how much harm will this thing do if it suddenly thinks because of its machine learning that, that weird things are going on. So um, I, it, as I said, it's not my area of expertise, but it does make me kind of nervous. Um, okay. Let's see. Well, we have a Rigraziani uh, here. Yeah, first edition still on my bookshelf. Um, so you have some fans here um, in the audience. Um, oh, well, let me <laughs> tell a cute story about the book. So um, when you write a book, you get like really proud of it. And it was such a thrill to walk into somebody's office and see my book on the bookshelf. And then I would get kind of spoiled. And so if I'd walk into somebody's office and I'd see a bunch of networking books and mine wasn't there, I would just be crushed. So one time um, that happened and I pretended to be just playful. I said, hey, where's my book? And um, the person said, oh, it's at home. I'm in the middle of reading it. So, <laughs> okay, good. But um, the story that people think is, um, um, you know, really cute was one time I was um, at an airport, I had four hours between my planes. I wasn't hungry enough to eat. I was too tired to do anything useful or even read. So I was just wandering around in a daze. The airport was really uh, very empty for some reason. And so as I'm just wandering around, there was this group of about five men who were talking and I thought I heard some magic words. I, I thought I heard them possibly say router or bridge but I couldn't quite tell because I wasn't right next to them. And one of them had a book on his lap that I could just see the edge of because there were papers on top, but it was the right color to be interconnections. So um, I was really curious. So I wander over to them with my carry-on bags and I sit right next to them, even though the airport is completely empty. So they stop talking and they're staring at me. And um, then I realized, oh, I guess I'm acting bizarre. That's kind of embarrassing. So um, um, I just said, oh, I was curious, what is that book? So he holds it up and it's interconnections. And I said, oh, I'm Radio Proman. So they all turn white and um, they go, no. And when finally one of them was uh, recovered well enough to speak, he said, we are in a panic trying to prepare a customer presentation and act like we know what we're talking about. And right before you showed up, one of us said, if only the author of that book were here. <laughs> and so I said, oh yeah, it's not a problem. It comes with the book you wish for me and I appear, how can I help? And I helped them with the presentation and I signed their book. I never had more fun <laughs> at an airport. You know, I sure hope they didn't try it again a couple of years later. It's like, if only the author of that book were here. So, <laughs> that's, um, that's a wonderful story. You can walk into Rick's office and, uh, and feel good then, because uh, it seems he does have the book. <laughs> we have uh, one additional question uh, from Lito Ibarra. How about speaking a bit more than usual about your own career, experience, and goals in an environment where people do not know you? Do you think women are forced uh, to do this in order to comp compensate for the wrong belief um, that women are less of an expert in certain fields? Well, yeah, it's, it's actually very tricky, of course. Um, I don't actually like um, saying, me, me, I'm real important. And when I go around, when there's um, a bunch of people in a meeting introducing themselves, um, you know, some people say, I invented the internet. <laughs> um, you know, I am in charge of whatever. And then when it comes to me, I kind of look down and I say, well, I, I'm interested in sort of network protocols and security protocols, cryptography. Um, it's just, it, I just sort of can't say, well, I'm a really important person. Um, the CTO of Dell, um, it, this sort of drives him crazy. When So when he's at a meeting and we do this, he always follows up after I, he's saying, well, Randy is actually being modest. She did this, that, and that. Um, so it's really nice if you have somebody else who can do that ra um, rather than doing it yourself. Um, but it's probably appropriate in certain um, settings to be able to, um, to sell yourself that well, that way. Um, I 
really have trouble doing that for myself, but luckily I, you know, due to a bunch of accidents, I've gotten well enough known that I don't really have to do that, but other people probably do. Um, now, it's not a gender thing. Um, um, people kind of assume all men are super aggressive, self-promoting, you know, whatever, and women are always shy and humble, and that's just you know, it may be proportionally, um, uh, statistically, that might be um, somewhat correlated, but almost all the men that I work with are fantastic people. Um, and, um, you know, there are some women that I've worked with that are every bit the, the bully that, um, you know, that they can out bully any sort of man. And again, anyone that acts that, that way, I've, I've yet to meet anyone that's actually good technically. So, um, yeah, so, right. So it's not just a gender thing. Um, so like when I, um, when people say, how can we um, make the environment so that women can thrive? I say, well, no, that's the wrong question. The, the right question is how can we make the environment so um, all good people can thrive? And so one thing is do not uh, reward this kind of bullying, self-promoting kind of behavior. Uh, um, another thing is like when you need someone to do some, to lead some task force, there are some people that just automatically raise their hand and say, me, me, me. And then they'll take complete credit for anything that the group does. Um, and then there's most other people actually would be afraid to volunteer because they'd say, well, if I really um, deserved it, somebody would invite me to do this. Um, you know, I don't want to be the one to say that I should do it. Um, also, they sort of think, well, I may not be able to succeed. So if you want to help people around you, what you should do is you should find people who probably could do a good job of doing that, could use the visibility and encourage them to volunteer. And if they say, well, I'm not sure I could succeed, say, people will help you. And, you know, definitely I will help you. Or, you know, and um, pretty much anyone else would be honored to help as well. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to do this. Uh, so anyway, did I... Um, answer that question. Yeah, I think I, I think guess you I did. Sort and, of did. Um, that's uh, so we we'll wait to see if we have. Um, you have spoken. Um, a say ask questions. Um, you know, let people that maybe are not. Um, uh, what would be the word? There are maybe more like introverts to sort of, um, you know, shine. Um, what is your take on other barriers that women in particular may be facing uh, in the work environment? For instance, uh, having to balance domestic responsibilities, uh, you know, with their job. Um, perhaps this idea also of the uh, imposter syndrome that, uh, you know, I believe you addressed um, at your uh, keynote um, speech at LACNIC 31 essentially this idea of like feeling that you're never good enough. Um, you know, what's your take on, on, on you know, there other barriers that, that um, you know, women may be facing in the work environment? Right, and whenever you say women, and there's plenty of men that have the same issues. You know, right. um, you manage to have a job when you have little kids. And um, so one thing I say about that is it's not necessary to always be climbing the ladder. Um, if you, when you have little kids, if you have a job that is not very challenging and you could do it in your sleep, cherish that job because it's the, if you can do it in your sleep, it's the only sleep you're gonna get. Um, so it's fine for, um, you know, when you're barely um, surviving because of all these responsibilities to, um, to be less ambitious in the workplace and not to resent people. Um, you know, I have actually um, uh, talked to people 
who say, it's not fair. I have to go home every day at five to pick up my kids at daycare. And these other people can work twice as many hours um, and they shouldn't be rewarded for that. And um, no, I disagree. You should be rewarded for how productive you are. Um, and um, yes, yeah, sometimes you might actually be sort of less productive than you should be because you're dealing with um, really significant um, um, issues. And your company ought to um, not reward you for that, but understand that this is a really good employee that um, currently is struggling with um, um, certain things. It's a temporary thing. You know, let's um, sort of not give them anything that's really time critical at work. And, um, you know, then when this passes, we're going to have a, a super um, um, loyal employee because we saw them through this um, crisis. But another thing you mentioned was introverts. So it's so important to talk to people outside of your group and get other points of view and learn from what they're doing. But it's very hard to make that happen in an industry of introverts. So one of the saddest things that I see is in the company cafeteria, people buy their food and then they look at the place where people are sitting and if they can't see somebody they know, they scurry off to their office and they eat all by themselves. And this is such a waste of um, time. Um, so you should sit with people you don't know. Now, this is very weird. I, I do it. But then people look at me oddly, like, why are you sitting here? And it sort of feels like middle school. <laughs> it's like, hey, you're not cool enough to sit at our table. Um, um, or they ignore me and they continue talking you know, to their friends. So um, it's, it's a very sort of hard thing to do. So what I kind of recommend is to have some tables like um, with a, a, a certain marking on them, a different tablecloth, that it's understood that you do not sit there in order to talk to the people you already know and exclude other people. That your responsibility if you sit at that table is to engage everybody at the table and um, make sure you talk to everybody. And you know maybe you can get people in the habit of, of doing this. Um, you know maybe have some leaders in that um, promise to sit at these tables uh, to maybe draw other people in, uh, so the first person won't feel um, all alone if they if they're sitting there. But have have people already in the table that as soon as you sit down, you're welcomed and um, um, and asked about what what kind of things you do and um, you know whatever. Uh, so yes, how you can actually force communication between groups because it is so important for them to learn from each other. So I, I think I answered that one. Yeah, thank you so much for that, um, Radia. Um, so it, it seems we don't have any um, additional questions from the audience, so maybe I'd like to post one last one um, to wrap up. Um, you have been in the technology and uh, the internet industry for quite some time now, if, it, if you, know, you feel that's uh, fair to say. Um, would you say that you're beginning to see more diverse uh, work environments, uh, perhaps in terms of you know, more women participation, uh, gender more broadly understood, disability? Uh, what's your take on how, um, yeah, sort of the diversity of uh, the internet and technology industries evolved um, in the last, you know, uh, decades, maybe? Uh, I do not see a difference. Uh, it, it really, um, yeah, well, there's um, still about the same number of women, and especially the more senior you get, the fewer there are. Um, there's, um, there seems to be a fair number in management. And so, um, you know, since I'm not a manager, I sort of don't care whether there's diversity in management. I want more nerds, uh, more female nerds. And so um, I've asked some people who were fairly senior um, technical people why they switched to the management track. And there, they could have, there's so many answers they could have given me that would have been fine with me. You know, like, well, I'm uh, good with people or they needed somebody in that role, but all of the people that I asked said, quote, I was not smart enough to stay in the technical role, unquote, which is very sad because th that wasn't true. 
but everyone sort of feels, every, everyone's kind of insecure. And uh, some people um, cover it up by being bullies and other people just um, get discouraged and try to do something they feel more secure in. So it would be good if we could all, first of all, um, you know, like be open about the fact that everybody is insecure. So uh, people don't think it's just them. Um, people should be willing to help each other more. Um, people shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. Um, so like mentoring is something that people always ask about is, um, yeah, um, am I somebody's mentor? And of course, I, I think everybody should be mentoring everybody at all times. I feel uncomfortable with this um, um, sort of directionality where I am the mentor, you are the mentee. Um, so, um, and I also think that it's sort of unfair to get matched with one person that you're supposed to look out for their career and find opportunities for this one person. Um, to have the senior person focus all of their energies on helping this one person seems kind of unfair. So I think everybody should sort of always be helping other people. So if you want to ask for advice about how to write a book, yes, I can help you on that. If you want to know what kind of car to buy, yeah, go someplace else. You know, I, I think wheels are important for some reason, but I don't know much else. Um, uh, so the, one of the most powerful ways of helping the people who are more junior than you is by asking them for help. This will empower them so much more than just passing on advice um, to them. So now I've forgotten what question I was answering, but hopefully I've answered it. Yes, you have, uh, and you've provided some additional uh, insights. So thank you so much for, for that, um, Radia. Um, well, it seems we don't have any additional questions uh, and we are at the top of the hour. So um, um, I think we're good to wrap up here. Uh, once again, uh, we thank you for your time. Um, you know, perhaps the participants uh, don't know this, but uh, uh, Radia had some trouble, um, you know, with her flights, uh, getting home and um, she's uh, now, uh, you know, sort of not quite, uh, you know, home yet. She um, stayed overnight um, at a hotel so that she could join us uh, today for this webinar. So we thank you, uh, Radia, uh, a lot for, for making it happen and for joining us today. Um, as for the participants, uh, we'll be sharing the recording of um, today's webinar. Um, so, you know, stay tuned and, and you know, do share uh, the link with other colleagues uh, to sort of spread the word about some of the great ideas that we discussed today around corporate culture. Uh, thank you uh, again, Radia, and thank you everyone for participating. <laughs>